Good day to all of you, wherever you may be. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and do the PowerPoint here. Uh, we're going to talk about the country as it has developed um, after Jackson, after Adams, um, a little bit of the pre-Civil War period. Um, set that up now. This will be a story of America going into even the 20th century to some extent. Uh, what we're going to talk about, um, America is becoming sort of like three different countries. Um, the North, um, it's different populations, different groups of people in the South and even the West. Um, the South is at this point um, agricultural. It is rural. Um, the largest cities in the South hold nothing to what the largest cities in the North are. And that's going to be the story throughout all of American one. And even today, if you look at a, a map in America and start to take a look at what you see there, um, most of the major cities population live in the Northeast. It's still the case. Um, and it has roots in this era. Um, the West also will be much more agrarian. It's going to have a different culture than the South even, but it's still going to be agrarian. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll answer these questions as time goes on here. Uh, a couple of big things to look at, too, are where a lot of the rivers run. What's the soil like? I mean, the South has a climate that is just lending itself to agriculture. Um, it's warmer there's more rain. Uh, the soil is good for this, uh, for cotton, for tobacco. Um, and so the country starts to kind of play to its strengths. And for the South, that strength is agriculture. For the North, um, and as you may know, for I know a lot of students where I'm teaching this right now in Cary have family that came from the Northeast. Um, ask them what the weather was like. I mean, the growing season is short. So this this part of the country, if you can see my mouse, north of about Pennsylvania, if you live in this part of the country, agriculture is not a good way to live. So industry starts to take hold there. And certainly the Industrial Revolution is something we need to talk about. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is a big topic you can study from world history, and, and, and it really coincides with what's going on in America at that time as well. Um, so new inventions, uh, you could look up lists of dozens of inventions, uh, the power looms, um, new sewing machines, um, these sort of things are really revolutionizing life in the North. It's also important to know that these jobs pay a lot more than farming. They still do. Um, farming has never paid exceptionally well. It's honestly why you need um, in the South at this time to be economically competitive, to have to use slaves to grow crops. Um, and it's also pretty common for, as we'll see in industry, for who's gonna work these jobs. Um, they're going for who can be paid the least. Today, we still see this wage gap um, for different ethnic groups, for men and women, and it's, it has roots going way back. Um, and you can look into the political side of what the causes are for that in our time on your own uh, time, if you'd like. Um, industry is the big point that we need to know for the Northeast. It's always associated with industry. That's um, if there was an NCFE on this, that's a big topic. Um, now, it may be important to just talk a little bit about what these conditions are like. Um, you do need to be near rivers. There are quite a few rivers um, in the Northeast. Uh, so these uh, these factories will often use the, the flow of water to power a factory. Um, if there is a spot in North Carolina, if you ever go to State Fair, there's like this little spot where as you go into the gate where they make hush puppies and you can see some of these belts that were cut and, and how they would work to an extent. Um, and you can really get an idea of what this would be like. Uh, imagining for the workers as well, this is also pretty dangerous work. Um, that will become an issue for you in American Two next semester. Um, the, the dangers and how labor is gonna to respond to it, the heat, um, the hours. I mean, it's not uncommon to work 12 and 14 hour shifts in these things. And once the light bulb is invented and we can actually see what we're doing, 
at night as well. I mean, it totally changes society. And then, then we're doing this um, in 12 hour shifts, six days a week. Um, so you can read this pause if you'd like. Um, you can see it's it's a rough life. Um, often children start working in these jobs. Um, women and usually just be lower class, uh, middle class. Uh, I was token of how well you were doing was if you could honestly afford for your wife to not have to work and she could stay at home with the kids. Um, so keep in mind, if you see women working, especially in this time, it's very likely that they are very poor, um, unfortunately. Um, norms of gender and who works and uh, the woman's places in the home is a whole different idea at this time. Um, so you can pause this and read if you would like, uh, but for sake of time, I'm not going to read over this. Um, there's a world history story that does connect back to America that I'm not going to talk much about here, but there is the Irish potato famine. And what I really need to get into of what um, this starts to look like, the potato famine in Ireland leads to many, many deaths. Um, so one thing that some Irish start to think of how can we get away from this problem is moving to America. And there are um, a trend in America even today that you see in some circles. America is not very welcoming to immigrants who are different than those who already live here. Um, what I mean by that, uh, as you'll see, is if you are at this age, if you're a person of English descent, maybe even French descent, but English speaking, um, Americans as a whole today and even at this time, they are primarily a Protestant Christian nation. Um, and, and so if you held those values and you came to America, emigrating into our society is not very hard. So anyone who's ever different from that trend, they're usually going to face a lot of discrimination. And they're probably going to move into a neighborhood that's going to be more people like themselves, which then leads to neighborhoods that face discrimination. So in, in the North today, it's a lot different than if you've lived in the U.S. South your whole life. It's, it's a much different form of... Um, I'm going to use the word segregation, but I don't know if that's the best term for it. So you'll have like in New York or in Chicago or in Milwaukee, you might have like a Jewish neighborhood. Then you may have a Catholic neighborhood. You may even then break it down more and have like a Polish Catholic neighborhood. Um, and, and, and it's as these immigrants came in, they moved into neighborhoods where there were people like themselves who lived there. And even into the 1950s, 1960s, if you were moving into one of these cities, a, um, and I'll, I would put quotes up and I would say a really good realtor. I would have my air quotes up if I was teaching this in class. Um, a really good realtor would even know these things about you. You know, for instance, they would say, well, you are Jewish and they would only show you homes in Jewish neighborhoods. So anyways, back to the PowerPoint here. Um, most Irish do not come to the South, the U.S. South, for instance. They usually don't go West. They usually settle in New York or Boston. They start finding jobs in industry, and they're willing to work cheap. Um, another thing about laborers coming to America that you see today, if you want to go into the whole South Park, they took their jobs. Um, immigrants usually come to America, are usually willing to work for a little bit less money than someone who grew up in America, and there ends up being a stigma. They're taking our jobs. Um, you hear that today, um, as I record this, Trump was talking about um, closing America last night, uh, as I record this in the COVID-19 era. Trump, a couple of nights ago, posted a tweet that he was going to suspend immigration into the United States for 60 days. He claimed to protect us from the illness. He also claimed protecting American jobs from immigrants who would take them. He said it was an economic move as well as a health move. Um, look it up. He said it. Um, if you really, really want me to, send me a reminder and I will uh, find you the link for the article. Um, even in the 1840s, that was an argument about immigrants. They're taking our jobs. Um, There's also a lot of these people die at sea just trying to get here. Uh, malnutrition, if you, want to, uh, if you ever read up about something called scarvy, it had to do with um, bad eating habits at sea. Often affected pirates as well. Um, now, as I said in the previous one, Irish do not receive a warm welcome in America. Um, there's, they're a different culture. They're a different accent of English. 
which also leads to them being picked on. They um, they have a different uh, culture in some regards regarding um, to find some good examples of this. Um, Okay. So um, remember, as Irish, they're a different religion. Their dances are different. Uh, their ways of courting are a little bit different. Um, and, and a big discrimination you would face in America a lot of times is about um, or just how, how I'm going with this. But religious discrimination in America is a big thing at this time, especially. Um, even among Protestants versus Catholics. So, and let me see, put it back on the presentation for that. Um, there also ends up being more German immigration at this time. Germans do settle in some cities as well, but Germans are also more likely to move west. Uh, for those of my, um, those of you out there who may play Red Dead Redemption, there's a couple of spots in the new Red Dead Redemption 2 where Arthur encounters uh, German-speaking people in the American West. And it does actually relate back to um, German immigration. It is historically appropriate to that time. Um, Germans are, are much like the Irish as well. The place they're not going to go is the South. There's very few German immigrants in the South. They're here, don't get me wrong. But they're much more likely to be found in the Northeast or the American West. Um, morally, they are much more likely to be abolitionists. They are... Um, also much more likely to try to maintain their their original language their original customs um they did bring the christmas tree to america for instance though um there are some towns in the american west some in texas or kansas nebraska where you'll find a town and if you were really old-fashioned you found like a phone book you'd open up you'd find all these names that have german um roots in them and uh, there's several communities like that in America to this day that are still left from this time. Now, there's always a response. Um, this is one of the things about American history. We never are particularly welcoming to our immigrant populations. Uh, we never have been. I'm not trying to say it's OK. I'm just trying to say it's not a new problem. Um, and at this time, Nativism is the term we associate with it. You don't hear it much today, but it sits out there. But nativism uh, can also be, if you want to construe in an assignment sometime, that who are the real natives of America? Who are the Native Americans? Uh, in this context, by the way, Native Americans are talking about people who were born in the United States, not the American Indian. At the time this flag is made, who we now call Native Americans will be what they would call the Indians. Um, they also had a little bit of a political party. They called themselves this because they never admitted who they were in public necessarily. If anybody asks you if what you knew about this nativism or whatnot, you would say, well, I know nothing about it. So they came to be called Know Nothings. Uh, and Know Nothings go, go hand in hand with nativism. And it's just basically the opposition of immigration, particularly opposition to immigration from people who are not like ourselves. Um, an unfortunate mark in American history as well, by the way. Uh, moving along to the Midwest, um, the steel plow, the mechanical reaper are making it possible to farm the American Midwest. And sometimes we now call this flyover country. Um, but the whole American Midwest from Kansas up down to Texas, up to the Dakotas, out to Ohio. I mean, this is some of the best farmland in the world. And it started becoming that in this era. Um, gradually, generation after generation, immigrant after immigrant, as the country expands, more and more people move further and further west into the Louisiana Purchase Territory and start farming and using this land. That'll also be a common uh, piece as we go forward is how that land is gonna be distributed, bought and sold, and what it will mean for statehood going forward, especially in regards to slavery, but that will be for another day. Uh, this is a mechanical reaper. If you want to pause and read about that. Um, agriculture ads, if you want to uh, pause and read about that later on as well. So we're starting to work on how to get things around the country. Uh, in the 1820s, there's there's documentaries on how the Erie Canal is built. Um, it's a wonder of the world for its time and how that thing was built. Um, many, many, many employees, many years, much work. 
um, lots of horses, lots of mules. And, and basically this thing is just dug out of mountainous territory to connect the Great Lakes to New York City. Um, and then it starts connecting the north and the east. Remember, the south is left out of this. Um, and there's still places today, it's still a national uh, treasure of a sort, the Erie Canal. Uh, so you can pause and read these on your own if you wish at a later time. Uh, so I'm just trying to get through and show um, many towns would have something they're known for, for making, for instance. Uh, I think I talked about this in class, you know, Pittsburgh, they're still the Steelers to this day. Pittsburgh was a steel town at one point. Um, so most cities would have a mill or something they're known for making. Um, the thing is, like once we build the Erie Canal, about a generation, maybe two generations later, the railroad starts to replace it. Um, and railroads, again, are primarily in the north and connecting the west. The south is left out of all this. Um, we start to connect the country a little bit more with something like the telegraph, eventually, of course, replaced by the telephone, eventually internet. But this is like the first stage in that, um, telegraphs. And you notice, as I've been saying, um, the National Road, which was last unit, but the National Road connecting St. Louis to Washington. Look at all these canals, railroads, all these things. But the road network and the railroad, the canal network in the south is a joke compared to what is going on north of Virginia. It's actually going to be one of the things that's going to hurt us later on in the U.S. Civil War. Um, the north has such a better infrastructure, to use that term that we use today to call it, the infrastructure is so much better in the north than the south. And the south is becoming like a, in, ter in that terms of development, the south is starting to look more like an undeveloped country. Speaking of which, let's talk about the south, where cotton shall be king. Um, the cotton gin was invented quite a while before this unit, um, but it uh, I'll try to give you the, the really quick piece. It starts making it more and more possible that cotton can be a profitable crop. And it actually leads to something you need to note in addition to what's written here. It leads to an increase in need for slaves. Um, the South is definitely a slave population area at this time. Slavery is growing. Um, the labor done by slaves is essential to the Southern economy. And so all you needed was someone to pick the cotton and then send that cotton to the gin. Um, and Eli Whitney's invention, in a sense, could be said that between two of his inventions, he also came up with some interchangeable parts that made industry possible in the North. You could actually construe an argument if you really wanted to, that Eli Whitney is indirectly responsible for starting the whole U.S. Civil War. Um, as mentioned here. So uh, the way he did this, by the way, with guns, he he, man, he made all these interchangeable gun parts. And then he uh, he laid out in front of George Washington a bunch of unassembled guns and challenged him to pick any parts. And he could build a gun right there that would function. Uh, before interchangeable parts, you would need a lot more blacksmiths, a lot more what you probably now call a machinist to individually make every little individual part for every piece of a gun that broke. Whereas with interchangeable parts, you break a trigger, you simply get a new trigger and put it in your gun. Um, as you can see here, with the, the cotton gin comes along in the early 1800s and the, the amount of cotton just takes off. In addition to the amount of slaves needed. Um, and it actually, the, despite all we talked about how big the North is getting at this time, the reality of the matter is the South is producing so much more cotton and selling it overseas. And that's actually the biggest uh, thing America's known for making. Um, and uh, there's more and more production shifting to what we now call the Deep South, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, South Carolina, Georgia, um, become very, very known for slaves, plantations. Um, and as far as how slavery goes, um, selling the children of slaves. Uh, slaves were allowed to marry. It was actually not uncommon to find vows for slaves where you would have till death or distance do you part as part of your wedding vows. Um, and, and it was not uncommon at all for a slave owner to simply sell one of his male slaves wife 
to another slave owner. Um, and then she ended up being shipped across the country. If you ever go see uh, Django Unchained, for instance, a more modern movie that may incorporate some of this, that's actually one of the uh, underlying plot elements there. Um, there are certainly those who don't like this. Um, you'll be getting more from that in a different PowerPoint. Uh, those who try to bring it up in Congress, the House of Representatives makes a rule to just automatically not talk about slavery. There's this thought that if we just don't talk about the big problem, maybe it'll go away. But that's not going to work out. Um, so um, slave life is certainly not something you want. Um, there was a piece in the Constitution, if you go way back, that the slave trade could be restricted. It does end up being that you can no longer import new slaves into the United States. So it does make it important that we treat slaves well enough that they can reproduce and then we can uh, have a replacement population if they can, um, if they can certainly produce more than two per couple, then we can grow the population of slaves in America. Um, and then we can start selling and making profit off of our slaves over long term. You could even think of a slave as an investment, which I know is just awful to say, but it's how they were seen. Um, it was also very, very uncommon to find a slave who might be um, educated. It was actually illegal to educate a slave to read, for instance. They were to be kept in their place. If I, I'll put that in quotes as well if I had my camera up. Um, and so there ends up being a little bit of a slave culture, um, which is a very, very sad black eye on American history that we they were treated in this way. But they would often um, they would start to develop their own culture. Um, they had their own way of worshiping. Um, they were largely uneducated in part because it was illegal to educate a slave. Um, and some might have a household servant type of job. Some might actually work in um, what industry there is in the South. You may actually find some slaves there. Um, but for the most part, this is going to be agricultural work. Um, what we're going to start seeing happen as uh, as you could say we're starting to industrialize agriculture, if that makes sense. We're starting to make it more streamlined. Um, whereas at one time before a cotton gin, you might give a slave a task and then you would just leave them alone and let them finish it. And if they didn't finish it on time, then you may punish them accordingly. We're going to start going more to like chain gang style labor. Um, slaves are put into groups. They are to work and from sun up to sun down. They are to be beaten if they look lazy, think lazy. I mean... Uh, heart, there were even people whose job was basically to beat and manage slaves. Um, oddly enough, though, as you can see here, it wasn't necessarily uncommon for some wealthier to trust a, a nanny, in a sense, what you may call it today, but have slaves whose job was to actually look after the children and nurse them up to the point that they were walking and talking and educatable, and then they may transfer over to someone else. Uh, and of course, a slave who got educated would potentially realize just how bad their treatment actually is, uh, which is actually why, if you go back to what I said earlier, it was actually illegal to teach a slave to read. Um, it actually becomes at one point illegal to free a slave. So Nat Turner's slave revolt is the big famous one here. Um, and it starts to become illegal. Uh, to allow someone like Nat Turner to become educated, to start rising. It actually becomes illegal for slaves to gather in groups of over a certain point, unsupervised. Um, you can start to see that there is certainly a big effort to make sure that slaves, as I'll put in quotes, stay in their place. Um, there's, this is also part of why slaves start getting treated in the manner they are, in that you see how they may... Uh, if, if slaves are working too slow, they would beat them. Uh, there could be a thought from a slave driver in a sort that that slave is trying to hurt the plantation. Um, so it, it, if, uh, if a slave group start trying to get together, uh, it may not. You wouldn't necessarily execute a slave 
because I mean, you need them to work, but maybe you split them up. Maybe I take a group. If I have a group like this is assembling and starting to talk about rebelling against me, maybe I sell them all off to various different uh, slaves, uh, slave owners across the country to split up their group. Um, there's a movie about this, the Amistad. Um, it was a slave ship that was actually turned back. It was actually on its way to the Caribbean and the slaves on board actually managed to overthrow um, the white slave on um, the ship captains, the slave owners who were transporting them and actually ha uh, got themselves taken back home. Uh, or and at least that was the attempt. Um, I'm going to skip over this part for now as uh, we're trying to streamline. I know this is already getting a bit long. As I talked about before, you know, the rest of the country is kind of moving along with canals and industry and moving on with new and new cool ways of living, in a sense, mainly the factory. It's becoming a little bit more progressive in society. The South is not that way. Uh, most of the world is kind of moving on from slavery. Uh, the British Empire has banned slavery around uh, this time frame in the 1840s. The only place left in the world, major developed country, that is that has slavery by 1860 is the United States. Most of the world has turned its back on it and starting to say that is wrong. And in the in the north and the northern United States, there are more and more people who are kind of on board with what we now see as like the progressive side, like Europe and most other Western developed nations. And people in the north are starting to say. We need to end slavery in the South. Um, and yet the South hangs on to it very aggressively. Um, and, uh, and so to the point that they might try to like stop any distribution of any abolitionist literature in the South. Um, trying to make sure that slaves can't be free to see that there could be a better life for them if they weren't slaves. Uh, they try to justify it with the Bible. Um, there's if, if you go look, if you do want to term how slavery is justified in the Bible, I mean, Southern ministers at this time justify this in any way they can particularly try to hang on to. Um, a sad part of American history, obviously. Um, but what it was, uh, so feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And hopefully uh, this PowerPoint was helpful.